Okay, hello everyone. I'm delighted to chat with people in Argentina. How cool is that? I've only been to South America once and that was a trip down to Lima to uh, give a class, uh, 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 give a talk at the university there. Uh, but I think this is pretty cool. And you gotta say, despite all the problems with COVID, the internet's working pretty well these days. And uh, what would we do without it? Anyway, I'm uh, here for the next hour willing to answer questions and so on. Um, I, I, I could give a little bio if you want. Um, nah, you should have looked me up. You know, when you, have, when you have a teacher or someone coming, you should look them up, find out what they're doing, what they've written, and then ask them, what are you working on now? And I remember when I first met Dennis Ritchie, the uh, creator, one of the creators of Unix in the C language. I said, oh, what am I gonna say to Dennis? He's gonna know I don't know C very well. Uh, it's, it's Dennis. And my wife said, ask him what he's working on. And at the time, what he was working on was streams. So this is back in the mid eighties, 1980s. So I am working, I am retired, which is an interesting question. What are you gonna do when you're retired? Now, I assume these are mostly young students listening here, and this should not be um, a question foremost on your mind, though it is a good idea to start saving your money now so that you can do what you want to do when you're retired. Uh, my wife and I did a lot of saving and a lot of investing. And, you know, we skipped going to Disneyland a few times and uh, in, made some nice long term investments. And now I'm retired and every day is Saturday and I can do whatever I want. So what should that be? Until about six months ago, it was travel to conferences a lot and visit friends, but that's not such a not working out so well right now. So I'm working at home. Uh, I write apps for uh, I, iOS devices, um, and you can look at my web page to see some of the stuff I'm working on. What I'm working on right now is something called the Digital Darkroom, which was a science museum exhibit I co-authored with a fellow at Bell Labs about gosh, uh, 20, 30 years ago. And it was in the Liberty Science Center, which is one of these hands-on children's science museums. I hope you have that where you are, uh, places where they can go in and try science exhibits and, and do things like that. Um, and uh, so I've been refreshing it and uh, working hard on getting those old transforms and new ones uh, put into uh, the application. Now. Uh, these are things that morph your face. I actually could hold this up and show you what, ooh, I suppose I could do that. Um, it's, uh, I just give you a taste. Um, this is my big iPad. Come on, wake up iPad. Boom, 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 boom. We go here, boom, all right, here it is. Let's see if you can see that. Um, eh, not so, not so well, I can't do very much with it, but you can, you can do things like, uh, let's do an Escher transform. And uh, you get things like this, live video images like this. Now, this is very common, this sort of thing in, uh, uh, here's Mondrian at emulating the artist Mondrian. Uh, let's see, what, what's another one? That, if Seurat were uh, painting pictures, it might uh, look like this. I know you can't see it very well. Um, now, there, these things are common. You, you can, uh, there are lots of different apps that you can do fun things with your pictures. But what you can do with this one that you can't do with most of them that I'm familiar with is you can go in and add several of these together and play different combinations. And I have found it to be quite entertaining. Let's see, I'm just, uh, for example, we could do the Escher once again, that's CPU time right there. And we'll do another Escher and change the size of it. And turned on so it's slow, so you can't see much there. Um, anyway, I, I do this for a few hours in the morning. Um, another application, I live next to a freight train line. It's about uh, two blocks that way. and. Uh, I find trains to be quite interesting. And they're interesting processing things you can do. For example, 
can you listen to a train that's passing and have software figure out how fast the train is going? And the answer is there are about four or five different ways you can do that just from the sound alone. And I'll leave it as an exercise to the student to try to figure out what sort of audio processing might you get that would give you a pretty good idea of how, how long a train is, how fast it is, what kind of cars are on it. And for me, it's a chance, it's a project to learn more math. I decided when I retired, I was gonna get more math. I was gonna learn more stuff. So I'm deep into fast Fourier transforms and linear algebra, which I didn't do so well in, in college 50 years ago and that sort of stuff. And I, I bought MATLAB yesterday. So I'm sitting here learning how to do all of this stuff and really having a lot of fun with it. Plus we live on a nice farm. We walk around, uh, look at the trees. My wife has some chickens and about half a million bees. So we do some work with honey and, uh, and I hang out with a mentor project. Oh, you know, I should have worn my mentor project shirt. Sorry about that, Debbie. Um, didn't occur to me this morning, it should have. So anyway, uh, Debbie has introduced me as the fire of the father wall, firewall. That of course is a marketing term and uh, marketers have called several people the father of the firewall. Uh, I've told my kids that they're the brother and sister of the firewall, though the firewall never comes to our family meals. Um, it Being the father of the firewall is indistinct enough to not be true or false. I did not invent firewalls. Uh, I did do some early work with them. Uh, what I really did was uh, co-authored the first book on firewalls. And some of your older IT people might have a copy. Uh, it got translated into about 13 languages and sold a huge number of, of books, uh, which was pretty amazing. Um, so that's... Uh, a little bit of what I'm doing these days. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. It's okay if your English isn't that good. It's okay if it's a stupid it, question. There's a question from the live stream. Yes. Robert Dowling, Bill, what's the safest way to protect my Bitcoin private keys? Oh, Lord. Okay. Um, the, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, I. I looked at Bitcoin back when it was $300 a Bitcoin and said, you know, maybe I should chuck a few bucks at this just to see what would happen. Uh, but I didn't. So I don't have a Bitcoin wallet. I, I don't use one of the places that have been hacked or haven't been hacked. I would suggest that if there's a special key, there is a special key that, that is you for Bitcoin and you, uh, I wouldn't keep it online. I'd have it on a, a thumb drive and bring it out when you need it. You know, you lose that key and the money's gone. Um, in fact, I suspect if there isn't already, there'll someday be an industry where people go and try to find lost keys. Uh, but that's a really hard com computation problem. I don't, I don't know anyone's gonna get that better. Um, so not a very useful answer to you, I'm afraid. Uh, I, I do have another question. Sure. That's coming on the live stream. Should we fear quantum computing's effects on our current passwords regime? Okay. Um, so the, when you're talking about security, you're talking about risks and costs. Um, how, what's the value of what you have and how much time, effort, risk, and money is someone willing to spend to get that from you? Um, and for most people, their passwords and stuff are not that useful. Um, you know, you personally, I, I don't know, if, if you're a U.S. senator or somebody like that, yes, you're getting targeted and you have to be very careful. If you're just a random grandma somewhere around, you're probably not going to be targeted specifically. But what hackers like to do is say, let's go find 100,000 passwords from, from 100,000 grandmas, if you want. And by the way, I'm not saying bad things about grandmas. I've known some very sharp grandmas. Uh, that Let's go get 100,000 of them. We'll try 10 million accounts. We'll get them for 100,000, and then we'll steal money from them or use their machines to attack other people. Um, so the question comes 
at the heart of it, it comes as to, to the strength of cryptography and the keys and how badly someone wants to get what you're getting. Now, it is certainly true that there are some crypto systems like RSA that look like when you get a pretty big quantum computer, you're going to be able to crack it. Um, this is not a surprise to anyone. Um, and the cryptographers have been thinking about this for decades. You know, Peter Shore's algorithm came out around when the early 90s. So we've known about this for what, almost 30 years. <clears throat> and there are things you can do that make it much, much harder for even a quantum, any quantum machine we can think of at the moment to do something with. Um, you know, doubling the key size makes it much, much harder than twice as hard to do. Um, there are crypto systems. I mean, there's a huge amount. This stuff, uh, you know, you get an AES encryption key of 128 bits. That's awfully good. And I don't know if you can crack that. If if anyone knows how you would crack that with with a quantum machine. The other thing is to have at the moment. If there are giant quantum machines, they're really big, expensive, hard to build things in the basement in Washington or someplace, and it costs a lot of money to run it. And are they going to attack you? No, they'd rather read mm, maybe some president's mail or uh, you know some some military secrets and stuff. Uh, I don't think it would scale very well. Now I'm talking through my hat here. I don't know. Uh, they certainly don't tell the world about this, but it seems to be really hard. Um, I, I hope I answered the question. Feel free to follow up if you if you want. Hello. This silence was brought to you from the New York Public Library. I have a. Oh, good. There's some, uh, Maria has a question. Maria, would you like to unmute and ask? Sure, please do. Sure. Well, uh, thanks for having us today. And I was willing to ask you, how was the process? Uh, you said you were present on the early stage on the development of the firewall. You said you not were in the first one, but you were in the early stages on producing something new, on developing something new, because you weren't actually new in what we were doing, you were doing, but how was it like, how was that process on um, okay. working on something? Okay, I, I, yeah, that's that's an interesting question. Um, so I'm retired now and I can work on anything I want. And if it's a waste of time, if I spend all my time watching Netflix or playing Civilization VI, there's nobody who's gonna complain. Uh, but there are things I wanna do. Are there jobs that are like that? The answer is yes, at least there was in, up until recently. Um, in 1987, I joined Bell Labs um, and I got there. I, I came in basically as an IT guy. I said, I'm gonna be an IT guy to all the Unix people. I really like the philosophy of Unix. I like the work they did and uh, they were awesome people. And I went and started working as, you know, just, I, actually I went up to Dave Prezada who is the postmaster the electronic postmaster and said, I want to do this. Why would you want this job? Because you get to learn everything. You get to figure out, you get really good at what's going on. And I did, I was postmaster at Bell Labs for 10 years. And, uh, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I still remember all that stuff. Um, but Dave also had built a firewall, an application level firewall, the gateway we called it back then, was not the first firewall. Um, there were others, Deck had them and so on, but I think it's fair to say that I knew pretty much everybody in the world who was building firewalls, at least outside of the secret folks in the government. Um, and we were a little club and we'd, we'd sort of meet at conferences and talk about things. And um, so I'd been at Bell Labs one year when in November, 1988, the Morris Worm came out. Now it's been a long time since then. Uh, but this was something where I woke up in the morning and a friend called and she said, there's something really bad going on on the internet. Now the internet was really new back then. And I mean, it, it, in some sense, it'd been around since the 1960s, but uh, it was just starting up. There were, one person estimated there were about 6,000 computers on the internet. And uh, I, uh, I woke up and I said, oh gosh, 
I wonder if whatever happened on the internet got past the firewall. See, I had taken Dave's original firewall and had made it more efficient and uh, decided, you, you know, I, I did a few things here and there and I tightened it up some. And the question in my mind was, did they get through my firewall? Oh, not that it would be bad for AT&T so much, but I would receive so much ribbing and flack for having a firewall that didn't work. Um, I, I did not like that uncertainty and we'll get back to that in a moment. So I arrived at Bell Labs and people like Peter Weinberger, that's the W in AUK, was on the phone saying, did you get the worm? We didn't get the worm, it didn't come through us. And I'm thinking, oh great, well, good. It didn't come through the firewall and I know why. It turns out the, the worm used about three different techniques to break into systems. And Dave had fixed two of them. The third one he had never touched. That was the finger demon, if you care about that. But a few months before, I had looked through all the, the services on the system and said, what's this finger demon? It's running its root. That's dangerous. Why should I run a service I don't trust? It's late in the day. I'm sort of lazy. I'll just turn it off and see who complains. And it turns out if I hadn't done that, the, the worm would have made it through my firewall into at and uh, and so there are a few lessons just from this start here. First of all, you really need to have a security setup that you can say, they're not gonna get through me. And then you need to have an explanation that's simple and convincing. And uh, that's thing number one. Thing number two was I had been working, nobody had told me to work on the firewalls or the mail or anything like that. I was at Bell Labs. Your job was to find things to do, do them. If you do a good job, great. If you do a bad job, well, maybe we'll fire you in a year or two. Um, so it, it's, I, I know Google at least used to do this for like 20% of the time you were supposed to work on your own projects. At the labs, everything was your own project. Every day was sort of Saturday. And it was very cool sitting in a room with really smart people and working on this stuff and learning how it worked. So what happened after that was I thought about Dave's firewall, uh, which had some really important concepts in it. And I said, what I really need is something that it is two layers and they have to get through both layers and the both layers are very simple and they're not running any finger demons or anything like that. And, uh, I, and then I wrote it up and it, I no, I don't know if anybody would ever use this, but I wrote it up and you know all these PhDs, I, I'm not a PhD, all these PhDs had been writing papers and stuff. I wrote up a paper, gave it to my boss and he read it and said, mm, this is a good paper. So I submitted it to Usenix, it was accepted and I gave it in January, 1990. And that's how I, as raised by wolves, I did the back door of coming in to be a researcher and I started doing more stuff and you can read if you go to my webpage, you can read early papers and find out the sort of things I was doing. Um, but getting back to your question, uh, there were things I did. For example, I realized only about 15 years ago that the word proxy was, well, the word goes back to eight, 900 years in English, but the use in computers, I had used it in that first paper. I, ha I had a program named gate D but there already was a gate D. I said, I need a different name for this program that acts on my behalf in the firewall. I'll call it proxy. And I realized that actually was where the word was coined for what we call proxies now. So it wasn't that there weren't other proxies. Uh, we had some good ones. I actually, uh, with Steve Bellavin, we came up with a DNS proxy and got patents for him as well as a paper. Uh, so it was early. It really helps to be early in something with lots of spare time and interest to work on it. And that's why I was in the middle of all the firewall stuff going on. But around 1993, I talked to, to Steve Bellavin and I said, you know, there are about, we really need to collect this information. There are about 10, 13 papers on firewalls that we should staple together into a book. And he had been ha getting bugged by a publisher for, mm, gosh, a decade or more, said, we need a book, we want a book, we want a book. Steve went to the publisher and he said, oh yeah, what a great idea. But no, you can't staple things together. You have to write it yourself. Oh, it's like having 13 English papers assigned to you, except they're not in English. 
there's stuff about firewalls. And Steve and I sat down and laid out what you needed to have. And there were some chapters that had stuff I was, I said, well, we really need to talk about ARP. And I don't know much about ARP. So it, it was a discipline that helped me learn about ARP and other stuff and, and, and get it. Steve and I had a wonderful collaboration. We wrote without ego. Uh, I, I don't like to read my own writing, at least not immediately. But I'd write, I'd suddenly feel, oh, here's a chapter, blah, and spit it out to him. And a day later, it would come back different and better. And we'd bounce it back and forth. And it turns out our style was very popular. The book, uh, people love the book. We were told we were going to sell 10, 12,000 copies. Um, our first printing was 10,000 copies. And it sold out in two or three weeks. Um, they, they printed another 20,000 copies without even let us, letting us fix the bugs that were in the first edition, the first printing. Um, and uh, it was exactly the right time. I think our style was informal and people liked it. Uh, we ended up really training the first generation of internet security people. And in that sense, yeah, I'm one of the fathers of the firewall. But there are lots of other fires, fathers like Deborah Estrin and Dave Rosado and, and uh, oh, geez, uh, I forget names. There, there are uh, at least half a dozen more people who did a lot of work on, on this sort of stuff. Plus, a lot of people in the government had done this inside but had not really published what they were doing. So that's how I became the father of the firewall. Well, actually, I didn't call it that, but the marketing people you know, how do you sum up the story I just told you into, oh, Chance, well, he invented firewalls. No, I didn't do that. Little bits, maybe around the edge. Um, but I certainly, I wrote the book and I've given talks in 35 countries about internet security over the last 25 years. Um, so that's, uh, that, that's how that came about. Steve Bellavin called that book a 320 page business card. We got invited to all the CIO breakfasts I got to meet President Clinton and shake his hand and go to meetings with Nobel Prize winners and so on. It was amazing. And if you had told me 40 years ago this was going to happen to me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have guessed it. So there you go. I hope that answered your question and hope it wasn't boring. And uh, let's see. Yes, Javier. Javier, uh, my Spanish yes. not, yes. Yes, it's Javier. Javier, my Spanish not so good. Don't worry, my English is not so good also. So we, are, uh, we are at the same level. <laughs> I, I have only been in this country a short distance. Uh, so it's okay. No, you have to come here when we restarted the fly and you're going to pass a good time. If you like, if you like the barbecue, we have the best meat. I do, and I have had Argentinian beef in London, New York, San Francisco, and Amsterdam, and I'd love to try it there in person. When yeah. travel makes more sense, yes, I'd love to come on down. Yeah, no. so no, my question is very simple. When I was, I uh, have this say uh, that age, 14, 17, yes, or a little less, <laughs> we go up with a movie that it was War Games. I don't know if you remember the movie. Oh yes, I remember War Games. Uh, and I was fascinated with the idea that all the code programs have the back entrance, you know? And all the time I have the doubt, if that's, it's a real thing or just it's an invention in all the movies that they put like the back entrance, you know? And you can make disasters changing a little bit the code. So <laughs> because I am not so well in computing and programming and all that, yes, and computing science, I have the doubt if that is true or not. It, do people put back doors in their software or in their systems? Yes. Um, yes, very often. Um, and that is one of the things. Remember I said after the worm did not break through, I said I wanted to build a firewall that would be rock solid. And one of the rules I had was no secret back doors because I don't want to wake up in the morning and say, Oh gosh, I wonder if they found the back door. Now, I, in my own little house here, I have a firewall over in that closet. Um, I'm protecting my farm from the world. It, nobody cares. But even so, uh, if I don't have the right key with me, I can't log in. There's no secret back door to my house. 
and into my network, not that it matters. Um, but it's very common to have it. Um, back in the 1980s, and in fact, into the 90s, the mail program on Unix that transferred most of the mail was SendMail, written by a friend of mine, Eric Allman. Um, SendMail was a very large program, and it was written in C and run as root, uh, which means if there was a bug in it, you could break into the system. And it turns out there were bugs in it all the time. Um, and that, in fact, one of the things Dave Prezado did on our firewall was said, we're not running SendMail and wrote his own mailer. Uh, with a much safer kind of uh, philosophy behind it than this one monolithic program. But it turns out Eric also included back doors. Weird language for, for rewriting headers and such, and not easy. I remember it when I first got onto Unix, they said, oh, I've got my first son's system here. I'm going to make email work. And I got into SendMail and it's, what is this crap? I can't figure this out at all. And uh, it turns out that a lot of people had trouble with SendMail. So Eric put in back doors. And uh, one of them was a command called debug. And you just type in debug and it says, OK. And now you can run shell scripts on the machine. Um, and that was, in fact, one of the ways that the Morris worm spread. Uh, so yes, uh, backdoors are very common. Uh, you know, there's this tension. Uh, if you put up a system that people use uh, and it's a high security system, what happens if it breaks? You know, if, on the occasion when my mail stuff broke at Bell Labs, I got my head ripped off by researchers. My mail's not coming through, fix it now. And if that happened at two in the morning, and I don't remember it ever actually happening then, uh, you might want to have some way to reach in from home and tweak a few things instead of driving to work and, and fixing it there. So there's, there's been an incentive to do that. There are also incentives to do it from manufacturers who wanna fix or load new firmware in, that sort of stuff, and of course, there are spies who want to put in back doors, and there have been back doors in a variety. Uh, there was a back door in a firewall product from Israel at one point. Um, so yes, they do do it. Uh, War Games got that right, um, and it, you know it shouldn't be there. And you can hide them very. You know, code is big and complicated. It's not hard to hide stuff like that. Thank you very much, Will. Yeah, I hope that helped. Yeah, no, very much. Yeah. Because uh, as I told you before, I grew up with that movie. So for me, it's like, wow. Yeah. A teenager can do that. It was like, wow, too much. Well, you, you would hope that modern military networks don't have backdoors like that. But you know, even if there's no intentional backdoor, there's still software that gets broken into. I, I was just reading some story. Apparently, the Chinese are wrecking havoc on the US Navy networks. Um, I, I don't know any of the details of it, but it's plausible. You know, a big network is hard to manage even if it's a military network. Ah, yes, it's great. Uh, I have just one short question because you mentioned the military network. Yeah. Uh, I hear uh, like a gossip in a way, you know, and these kind of things that the internet was first a military community service and they, they sell or they put a service at the civil areas. But at the beginning was like a military communication system. Yeah, I, um, it, certainly the, the internet came out of a few things. First of all, it came out of some people like Len Kleinrock saying, you know, if we cut our packet into our, our data into packets and send it through as little chunks of data, we can do a whole bunch of interesting things with that. Um, and he did that that sort of paper in 1962. I think Dave Clark had stuff. There were a few people who said you do this. Now, at the time, uh, telephone companies would set up circuits between two points, and that would be a dedicated circuit going from point A to point B. Um, 
And this was a radical way to do it. There's no circuit between us. We're just sharing this cloud in the middle that shuffles packets back and forth, and maybe they get lost and so on. Well, DARPA is a research group, a, a, a re, part of the US government uh, that does military research, but you know, it, not, it's not all classified. And they really uh, paid for and, and sponsored a lot of the work. But this work all came out of universities and research labs and the military and others just trying to get this thing to work. And uh, I remember when I started at Bell Labs, the uh, there was NSFNet, which was run by the National Science Foundation, and that wasn't supposed to carry commercial traffic. Uh, that was supposed to be research traffic only, which is a problem. If you're working at Bell Labs, you're doing research, but you know, eventually that research is for a company. So is it commercial? Nobody asked us too much about that question, but there was also Milnet, which is a military network. And whenever something wrong happened, something bad happened on ARPANET, um, the Milnet would cut off its connection to the world. Um, and sort of like a turtle come in and, and wait and say, okay, if you figured it out, okay, we'll, we'll connect again. And of course, there were a lot of students in universities who would attack those military targets as well. So there was a lot of hardening going on there. Um, so the military certainly had a P, had was part of it. Um, an, another story about the, the development is that if you have these packets without definite routes, that if the internet gets severed someplace, the packets will find another way to go around. And there are some amazing stories of how that can happen. And so maybe this is giving some resistance to nuclear attacks or that sort of stuff. It's usually resistance to tobaccos, which should cut the wires, <laughs> cut the fibers. Um, uh, certainly, the US government went whole hog on the internet by the 90s. I, uh, a lot of the people I talked to and helped and did, and did work with in the 90s were either law enforcement who were trying to figure out this new high tech crime stuff and how to find bad guys, and the government who was trying to figure out well, the US government has three levels of networks, right? They have tippy top secret, they got secret, and they've got sort of a confidential, we don't want you here, but it's not so bad. And they are all separate from each other with strict rules and so on. And how do you do that with the internet? And they worked on that problem. And as near as I can tell, uh, have got a pretty good solution to it. Um, but it, they, they certainly applied what, what we'd learned from everything and what they knew from it. Anyone Thank on the chat much. have questions? I am eager to answer, make super interesting answers. I do have Hello. a question. I do have a question. I have two questions. Go for it, Maria. One is this one. Oh, yeah. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, good. Uh, um, this is about password. You just say I'm listening to other conferences talking about password, password, and that you have to put very hard passwords. And uh, the last one said, instead of putting a password, like say in Mansfield 481, use a quotation like, I love you, or I live in Argentina. So make it hard and uh, change it. And I think two things. Uh, do you think that I'm a regular people say, so you just already said that, like, it's, practically useless to have those kind of um, passwords. And uh, uh, do you have those passwords? Uh, it's uh, useless. And the other question is, what about password managers are also useless or like for regular guys? Because I think the same to you. I only have four passwords and I like switch it Could on. Be. And when this one does Work, uh, well, I put the other one. Well, hey, wait, wait. Get, let me get answer the first one, then I'll get to your second one. Um, the answer about passwords can be a semester long class. It can be a 90 minute password talk, which I have online. You can go listen to my ruminations about passwords and how things we got wrong, or it can be fairly quick. Um, passwords, if, if you only get a few tries to try a password, like five tries, 
then it really doesn't have to be that strong as long as you pick a password that nobody can guess. Um, and because after they try five, the account locks and the game is over. Now that's assuming they can't watch your keyboard. They don't have software in your computer that's watching the password go by, uh, that sort of thing. But the way these attacks usually work, uh, you know, there's a computer at the other end that says, is Maria's password, I live in Argentina, is, is this the password? They have to store the right answer in some form. And so they have a password file. And there are lots of different ways to do this. And what happens is that uh, the bad guys get their hands on the password file, which might have 30 million passwords in them. Now, if they're really stupid, they have the text of 30 million passwords in them. They're not hashed or anything. And we have had vast data dumps of passwords like that from a whole bunch of things. You can look them up, you, you see them out there. In fact, if you want, you can probably find places that have collected these and you can download half a billion passwords that have actually been used by people. Um, so what do you do as a user if they've got the password file? It doesn't help. What you need is, first of all, not letting them get that file. That's not up to you. Uh, Two-factor authentication is a great idea. Um, you know, you can do it with your cell phone. There's some, there are problems with all of these things. As they say, there's a whole undergraduate degree here. Um, or you can put your password in something that actually stores it pretty safely. Um, these smartphones are great. When I, oh, I wonder if I have one here. When I was at Bell Labs in the late 80s, we had a little device that looked like a calculator that stored a key in it. And it actually was quite secure. Um, but the dream was, you know, why do I have to carry this thing around to log in? Well, now we carry something around that has way more power than that. And these things actually are locked up pretty well. And so you can use something like this, uh, a, you know, a smartphone or something of that sort. A password manager is a great idea. There might be one password to rule them all. And that one well, maybe should be uh, careful or, you know, using your face and your fingerprint is not bad. Um, if you're curious, <laughs> oh, I'm not gonna do this. Yes, I am. Um, I have a password generator on my webpage, the insult generator. And I will just take one entry I just generated here. Let's see, where are you guys? There you go. Here is the password it just generated for me. You harassing ventricle of infected bristle tail burp. If nothing else, well, you know, a lot of people, when they pick passwords, cuss at the computer and say bad things at it. Here you can insult the computer with words that most people who speak English don't know. That has about 42, 43 bits of work factor in it, which is a pretty strong password. Now, you'd have to remember it or write it down. Well, we're not supposed to write it down. Well, that depends. You know, if you're worried about a family member or somebody in your company coming in and looking at the little post-it notes, yeah, that's a problem. If you're someplace where that doesn't happen, then you could write it down. Or you can write it in a password manager and lock it with a key that you remember. You know, even a long key after you used it for a little while becomes pretty easy to remember and that can lock up, you can lock other things with it. So it's there's a lot to your question. Passwords uh, can be useless. Um, there are a lot of stupid password rules, which are trying to make the password harder for so a computer program to guess. And they make it really hard to type and they make it hard to remember and you gotta have different ones. Oh yeah, and if you use the same password on different sites, you know, if, if Facebook loses your password, they're gonna try it on LinkedIn and you know Instagram and all the other ones and see if it works there. So having a different one in each site's a good, good idea. Um, that's just a few general things. Please feel free to follow up with more questions or your second question. I have a question from the chat. Yeah. Uh, from the live stream. Um, how about the issue of cell phone number porting? These people are calling the service providers and having phone numbers transfer to different yeah. devices so they can steal the two factor. Yeah. And the law protects them because the regulations state that the service providers cannot hold phone numbers hostage. Yeah. 
so, so that is a problem. And in fact, the text message as a second factor is actually pretty weak. There are ways to fool it or intercept it and so on. Um, a better way is to have the key stored in your smart device and have it do the interaction on your behalf. And there are systems that do that. Google Authenticator, for example, has one, has it, and there are others that are like that. There's another question. Um, I had a second, second question from Maria. Okay. I already did it. It was uh, if uh, I thought that a uh, password, uh, wait. Uh, password, password managers mean. were rather commercial because uh, who cares anyway if you won't be entering my computer or what, why? O sea, uh, the question was, this was password, password okay. managers. I thought that they were very commercial because there's who wants wants to get my information. You, but you just said that they can get it randomly just to play fun. That's what you say? Uh, no, like, it, it is possible to provide a commercial product that gives uh, a, password, a, a, a password book for you that they cannot read. Um, and if you are worried about some evil corporation stealing your passwords using their password manager, Go online and look at reviews. There are a bunch of them there. Some of those password managers are written by extremely careful and public-minded people. Um, and, you know, read some reviews about it if you're worried about it. Remember, if you if you write, have a password manager that loses the passwords, you're out of business. Um, so it's really not an incentive for a company to do that. Now, the other issue is what happens if a government comes and says, our law says you have to give me her password. Um, the answer that Apple is given is we don't have it. Uh, it's encrypted, we can't get it. Um, you have to break into the system somehow. And I like that level of security. Can I comment on recent Twitter and Facebook censorship of stories? Ooh. Yeah, um, I'm not for it. I don't want somebody in Silicon Valley filtering what I read. I'm a grown up. I'm going to hear things that I don't like. I'm going to hear things that are lies. Uh, whether they're helping or not, they're going to come, they're, they're going to arrive. And grown ups have to have intellectual discernment and figure out what's true and what's false. And uh, I don't think we can fix it that way. But that's what they're doing. And uh, I don't know what to say. I, I mean, I'm on Facebook all the time. I use it. It's how I stay in touch with my friends. Um, what am I going to do? Go to some other system that, where they aren't? Uh, I don't know. We have another question for you. Yes. Uh, from the live stream. When Bill was at Bell Labs helping build the infrastructure of the internet, what <laughs> were his and his team's biggest concerns about the social and political consequences of their technologies, and did they come true? Okay, wow. Well, first of all, I did not help build the internet uh, infrastructure. It was pretty much in place when I got to the internet. I started using uh, the net around 1985 and all the work had been done. And in fact, you really have to really admire the engineering. Most of the basic numbers and things about how the internet works were worked out by 1982 or so. And that continued to work starting from a few hundred sites till we had a billion people on the internet. That is an amazing engineering feat. Now it turns out four billion addresses weren't enough and we needed IPv6 and there are some other things, uh, DNS and some other thing, enhancements that came along. Um, but I did not invent those. Um, I did have a, bit to do with how AT&T deployed its internal intranet. Uh, I mean, that was already there too, but uh, I, I gave security feedback. I also helped AT&T with some of their early ISP stuff, WorldNet, for example, they came to me for with security questions and so on. Um, so, but the, the, the more general question I think I can probably answer some is uh, those of us free 
free spirits who are early on the internet, did we have any idea what it was going to be like? Were we worried about how bad things might get and so on? Um, I think it's fair to say that though we might have sort of thought about this a little bit, that we really had no idea how bad it was, how bad or big or amazing it was going to be. Um, I remember when the first spam came in the mail. Oh, all the experts were up in arms. Oh, why is he trying to sell a product on our internet? And uh, I mean, it seems silly now. I probably, though I have a spam filter, I probably delete 50 messages a day that are no, 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 no. Um, I should probably work on that. Um, there, and uh, though there was, <laughs> okay, so here, here's a part I did have a bit to do with. Um, the original idea of the internet was end, the end-to-end -end principle, which basically says everyone who connects to the internet can send packets to everyone else on the internet. There's this cloud in the middle, you just give a destination address and you two can talk. And that was the dream. And of course, it turns out the internet's a bad neighborhood. It goes to places where there are bad people doing bad things to you and other people. And it became clear pretty quickly that, um, that there were hacking attacks and people trying to break in. And the firewall really breaks the end-to-end -end principle or at least modifies it greatly. It says, no, well, my, the firewalls I did for Bell Labs basically said anybody inside can do pretty much what they want going out into the world. And we have logs and stuff. If they do something bad, we could chase them down. But that's not our worry. Our worry is someone coming in and disrupting things or stealing our secrets and so on. So I, when I was doing uh, talks about the firewall, I'd use the si symbol for a diode. You know, the, the data goes out, but it comes in on very controlled and limited places. Um, you know, you people on the outside never got to talk to send mail on the inside. They came to my mailer. I grabbed it, and, you know, with a pretty safe mailer that Dave had done. And I forwarded inside to the send mail on the inside. So we had a, a tough outside with what we call the soft, chewy center. Of course, it became a liquid center. If you get past that perimeter, that's a big problem. So, so uh, you know, had... You, you can still hear people grumbling about how the internet has changed. Um, uh, and, you know, some of the grumbling is justified and some of it isn't. For example, the internet was very much an effort, uh, mostly by the US and European um, uh, academics and academics elsewhere in the world, Australia and so on, uh, Netherlands. Um, but it, it, and it had this central control ICANN, which gave out names and so on and, and parceled out network chunks and such. And of course that had to expand. Also it's in English using Latin one syllables. What do you do if you speak Tibetan or Chinese? Um, you know, those domain names ought to work and, and they have, that, that, that's changed um, mostly. Um, so, it's it's been painful. I view the internet as still being an experiment. And thank you all for playing. We're, I, I don't practice much research on the internet anymore. I did a lot of internet mapping back in the late 90s and into 2000. I helped start a company that maps corporate networks to try to find holes in that perimeter uh, to see where data can leak in and out. And that, that company is still going after 20 years. I'm very proud of that. Uh, this is a nice research result. Um, so I, I think that answered. I'd be happy to follow up if you've got more questions on that. Let's see. I got a kind of a follow up for what you sure. said right now. And it's like putting in like kind of superhero terms, you're kind of the good guys that are preventing the bad guys from entering from common normal people systems or to governmental systems. How is it like to or what are the challenges those hackers or bad guys propose to you guys when you create a firewall? And is it something that makes you afraid that those guys finally crack your firewall and get inside? Okay. First of all, Maria, your voice keeps changing. I, I'm not sure if that's a connection. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, so host, 
you can do security at the host level. You can try to harden a, a computer's host so that people can't get in. And that's what I do, even on machines here in my tech room. Uh, they're running only one or two network services. I'm not saying you couldn't break in, but I think you'd have trouble with it. Um, but when you have a large collection of computers, they're gonna be ones with bugs that you can get into. And the, the, uh, the, 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 the advantage goes to the attacker because they often only need to find a couple of machines, maybe find a system administrator account on those machines who logs into other accounts. That is sort of a backdoor, isn't it? And uh, then they can break in. It is really hard to stop this. Um, and that's why we continue to have this problem. Some of it is because people demand services that aren't always implemented very well. There, actually, there are a whole bunch of reasons. You know, if, if you built a Wi-Fi camera uh, in China in 2004, you probably grabbed Linux for a kernel and you built it and you sold it. And, you know, now you're gone, you're doing something else. And that camera is sitting someplace. Well, that Linux probably had some bugs in it. And it's probably still on the internet and accessible somehow. And a lot of the break-ins go like that. So that is part of the problem that you really need to cut down the possibilities of attack so that you have a stronger ability to say this probably can't happen here. Now, the, the other piece, let's see. Um, of course, I had, to, so I had a firewall that at Bell Labs. Bell Labs is full of researchers, some of them doing cutting edge work on the internet with services. I don't know if they're secure or not. What did I do with them? I threw them outside. I said, here, here's your machine outside being on the internet. You know, you take your licks. Um, and some of them got hacked. Um, and I, or I'd say, how does your, exactly, how does your service work? Maybe I can build a proxy that'll make it work okay through the firewall. And then you won't need to have it on the outside and you'll be a little safer. And so I did a lot of that. Um, but people who really care just ran outside and, and lived in the, as I call it, skinny dipping on the internet. We are two mother and son, uh, yes. Thanks. <laughs> Other questions? Here, I will give you my insult generator. Yeah, uh, hi, uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, well, we were talking about uh, programming languages. I had started uh, learning about uh, coding uh, some years ago, but I could never uh, create a way of learn of uh, remembering the the coding language and, and all the prompts that you can make. Uh -huh. on the input uh, uh, and yeah. I was going to ask you if there's a, a way of, of remembering this uh, the codes that are going to be uh, imputed okay um, I oh I do have answers for you on this um, you know I'm 68 years old and back when I was 20 and I wrote out a resume we'd have a list of all the languages we know well I know a lot of languages now at 68 do I want to learn a new one you know, it's, I've got a pretty good collection. The answer is sometimes yes. And in fact, I recently dove into Go, which is an amazing language. Um, really the last language that I dove in a lot was Objective-C, which is what you program iPhones, iPads with. Um, not a great language, but it's a fabulous piece of hardware. I love it. I love what it can do. I love the power in the pocket. You know, this phone right here costs under a thousand bucks and it has more compute power than the $7 million Cray we had at Bell Labs in 1990. Um, it has more storage, uh, it's floating point functions are more, the GPU is more. Um, I, I mean, you could quibble a little bit about that, but this is really an amazing piece of hardware. I love living in the future and this is part of it. Um, so, the way I learned that language was I worked on projects. And that really is the way to do it. It's how I'm learning MATLAB today. It's I want to analyze a train signal. I went out, I took a movie, I extracted the audio. I've got a freight train going by. I'm running this into MATLAB. And now I'm figuring out how to do the Fourier transforms and signal processing and filtering and envelope processing so I can count how many clicks of the wheel go by. Um, 
having a project is really helpful because if you just sit down and read the book, there's just a bunch of commands. But if you sit there and use it, you say, oh, okay, how do I do this? And uh, Stack Overflow is wonderful for at, sort of asking questions, you know, how do I convert a string to data and, and that sort of stuff. Um, and the other thing, make a project in the language that you want to learn. And presumably the lang you're choosing the language partly because the project is interesting or useful, whether it's Python or Go or Haskell or whatever. And the other thing is steal code whenever you can. Um, and in particular, I steal code for myself. For example, uh, you know, I've written a lot of C code in my life. And if you're doing a network program, you're going to need to open a connection to someplace, www.google.com. Well, there's a chunk of code that'll do it, and a better chunk of code that'll do it on IPv4 or IPv6. I don't remember the details to that. What I do is I go and steal for myself. I figured this out back in 2004 and I go do a grep through and I find it and say, oh, here it is, cut, paste, boom, it's working. Um, and that is a way, I, I still do that with the apps. I don't remember all the stuff that, and of course the Apple keeps changing this stuff too. Um, one of the things I did with this digital darkroom was figure once again, how to get the camera to work to deliver video and different things. And it is complicated and the, the, the documentation isn't very good. And my old one didn't work anymore. It runs and says, oh, this is deprecated. You shouldn't do it this way anymore. Oh, well, how do I learn it? And then finally I make something that does what I need to do and I can drop that into different things. So get a project um, and you know, find something that's interesting and uh, do it that way is my suggestion. Thank you. My pleasure. That's my house. My house just said ding because NTP told my computer to keep the time right. And I have a cron job that at the top of the hour, not in the middle of the night, has my granddaughter's voice go ding. So that's my grandfather clock. Actually, it's my granddaughter clock, isn't it? Um, it's the sort of project I like doing. Bill, can you tell um, tell everyone what some of the projects are that you um, uh, have been working on that you might like uh, students to participate on, oh, or is that geez. too premature? Than I'll ever get through in the rest of my life. And I've occasionally sent you some lists of some ideas. Uh, I'm usually my problem, and this is fairly typical of people in research, is that I like to start things, but I'm not so hot on finishing things. You know, I do the first 90% of something and then I leave the other 90% for someone else to do. Um, which means as I'm getting closer and closer to the end of a project, I'm starting to say, oh, I wanna do this other one. This would be really interesting. And as a result, I have a pile going into the distance of various projects that I did or sort of did uh, and apps for example, the Chez Has Matt app, Chez Has, Debbie, you've seen it. That was, that was in the uh, App Store for a while. And what it did was it let you look up things so that you could look up something like 1013, which you'd find on the back of a truck, and that would be petrol. Um, that's not in the store anymore. And the reason is because Apple said, you're not following our user interface guidelines. Now I like their guidelines as a rule, and in, but I really liked how my interface worked. I'm very pleased with it. It was, we had fourth graders using it. It was terrific. Um, so that app needs to have someone go read Apple's user interface guidelines, which is not a bad thing to do. Apple really leads the world in user interface stuff. They're much better than Microsoft at it. Look at Chez has, and I'm perfectly willing to let someone have the code and figure out what it is that Apple didn't like about it and resubmit it. And I'd be happy to work with someone who wanted to try that. Now that's written in Objective C. And if you don't know C and you don't know Objective C, you got a ways to go. On the other hand, it might be an interesting project. Um, and uh, so that, that's the sort of stuff we have. Um, the train wheels going by <clears throat> is an app I've already got a name for it, click clack. 
And the idea is you just pop open the app as the train goes by and it tells you how fast the train is going and counts the cars, um, which is an extension of an earlier app that I sort of got 90% of the way through called Crackle Counter. You uh, turn on the app, you put popcorn in the microwave and it starts going pop, 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 pop. And it counts how many pops there were. And uh, you could leave it next to a TV while a movie plays and it'll tell you how many gunshots are in the movie. And I'm not sure what, oh, firecrackers. Uh, there are recordings of firecrackers going off. How many pops are there? They can be counted. And this is a chance to learn audio processing, which I learned a lot of from that. It's an interesting app. I, you know, there are 2 million apps in the app store, but I don't think that's in there. Um, so there's stuff like that. And if somebody were actually interested in working on this stuff, I could spend more time writing down some specs and stuff uh, that someone might be interested in working with me on. And, you know, I'd, I'd help out when I can. And, uh, but you should be a self-motivated sort of person. I'm not going to teach a class on it so much. I'll explain some things, but, uh, you know, if you want to know the audio processing, you're going to have to go learn it. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining. And, uh, Bill, thanks for coming on. And of course, Javier, Thank you so much for hosting this. Your students are always such a pleasure and so incredibly smart and wonderful. So we thank you all. I, I, I'm delighted. And you know, one of the things I think is helpful is to do things like this periodically because people think, oh, I could have asked him this. I could have asked him that. I'm willing to come back sometime. You know, I'm sitting here watching Taskmaster. You know, I, I can do this. And yes, my wife and I would love to visit sometime. Have a great evening, everyone. Take care.